Good evening and welcome to the fifth session in our ninth annual Turo University of California Social Justice Public Health Speaker Series. Hosted by the Public Health Program, my name is Gail Cummings and I am the Director of the Public Health Program and Assistant Dean in the Public Health Program at Turo University, California. As it is our practice before we begin today's webinar, we want to make sure that we pause and all of us uh, reflect that regardless of where we are, we sit on the ancestral and unceded territory. The city of Vallejo, which is home to Turo University, California, exists on the confederated villages of the Lejeune, the Karkin, and the Patwin peoples, who are the traditional stewards of this land we also pause to remember that our country is built on the labor of enslaved people who were kidnapped and brought to the US from the African continent and recognize the continued contribution of our survivors. And we acknowledge all immigrant labor, voluntary and involuntary trafficked, forced and undocumented peoples who have contributed and continue to help build this country and are integral to our labor force. As we do this work, it remains our collective responsibilities to critically understand these histories, to repair harm that has been impact that has impacted generations, and to honor, protect, and sustain this land. And for those of you who are joining us for the, fir the first time, the purpose of this seminar series is to provide upstream discussions around social justice and public health for our, our students in our MPH programs and professionals in public health medicine, education, pharmacy, and nursing degree programs, as well as for our community and global partners. And each year we focus on a different topic. The topic for this year is the impacts of technology on health equity and social justice. So over the course of these last uh, several sessions, um, we've been hearing from leading experts across diverse fields of health, health policy, public health, techno science, history, and social justice. And today we hear from an architect. All of us, all um, who are helping us to understand the current landscape, techno technological landscape with discussion centered on how it is deployed, developed and regulated, which can both promote and undermine, undermine social justice and health equity. Today, we are excited to welcome Caroline Franz Associate Studio Director from Garfield Innovation Group. She will be sharing her perspectives on digital equity and inclusion in healthcare. Looking forward to hearing what Caroline has to prepare has prepared for us today. After her discussion, it will be, it will be followed by a brief Q and A. Uh, and after the pre or during the presentation, please do feel free to submit your questions in the Q and A function um, in Zoom. But before I go ahead and uh, introduce Caroline, I have a couple of other housekeeping details I'd like to share. If you are interested in continuing education units and plan to receive CME or attendance credit, please sign in during the session um, and use the event code www.eads.com. Oh, excuse me. If you are interested in receiving a social justice badge, for this course on the impact of technology on health equity and social justice, please click on the link that I will actually place in the chat function following um, today's presentation. Lastly, uh, we are capturing highlights from our series in the social justice podcast, Socially Just, which is available on uh, podcasts and wherever you hear your podcasts. This season, um, this season will air at the beginning of January uh, 2024. So stand by for uh, information and emails that will be coming your way if you've registered for uh, the series. Now on to our guest. I am so pleased to introduce tonight's guest, Caroline France, who has been in design strategy and innovation for in the field for over 15 years. At Kaiser Permanente, she has led design, research, and strategic visioning for projects looking at health, health in the home, preventing adverse childhood experiences, COVID-19 response, and digital equity. 
Ms. Franz's career began in architecture, focusing on workplace healthcare and historical renovation projects. She has been an innovation strategist for clients like University of Mission, Michigan, Advocate Aurora Health, Health Quality Partners, Rush University Medical Center, Regional Health Partners of South Dakota, and communities in Denver, Colorado, Edmonton, uh, Calgary, and Edmonton and Calgary in Canada. Ms. France has worked and facilitated workshops and presented at conferences at the Cleveland Clinic Patient Experience Summit, the European Healthcare Design Conference, the U.S. Healthcare Design Conference, and the American Public Health Association Conference. Please help me welcome Ms. Caroline France. All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me today. I will get my screen shared um, and hopefully uh, engage in a great um, sharing and then discussion uh, with you all. So here, let me get the right buttons. All right, and hopefully we can we can see everything. So I'll be talking with you um, about a project that um, a pretty diverse team and I led at uh, Kaiser Permanente over um, most of the year of 2022 um, with a little bit bleeding into 21 and 23. So it was a um, multi-year project, but uh, uh, very inclusive of our social health practice, community uh, health, thinking uh, through things with our IT department, um, patient services, research. Um, and we really wanted to come together to put forward a perspective on how Kaiser Permanente could show up in this space. So I'll dive into some of the perspective that we had, as well as our approach, uh, how we kind of dissected the problem space, um, and then share a little bit of where we're going, because it is certainly ongoing work um, that will take a little bit of time, but welcome any questions uh, when we get to the end. And so when we kind of started off on this project, there was this large question of how can you foster and have health equity when we know that the digital divide exists? Um, and the digital divide is that uneven and unequal access to modern technology and internet. And when we started looking across the landscape, there were a lot of discrepancies. And at the time, there was not a ton of evidence-based research that really could put a pin on sort of where the digital divide existed and to what extent. Um, and for example, the FCC estimated that 19 million people in the US didn't have broadband, but then there were other entities, Broadband Now, that said it's actually 42 million of Americans can't purchase or afford broadband. Uh, and Microsoft, based on their software updates and the connection that they have to all of our computers, said, you know, it's actually 157.3 million people are not using internet at broadband speeds. They cannot download our product. Um, and so we started to see that the discrepancies alone paint an interesting picture. And this means that perhaps whether whose data is correct, um, a lot of those numbers are reflective in our member base. And there was something that we had to do here. And so when we started to think of how that digital divide was leaving people behind in our digital world, um, it actually directly impacts health, which we saw as something that was um, becoming more and more of a disadvantage and mentioned in you know, things like Pew Research. And so we knew that we had to dive in here and certainly think about the populations that we have that are particularly vulnerable to this space. And so we think of those who are over the age of 65, those who are historically marginalized, um, those who uh, you know, have less education attainment and how that impacts their tech savviness, their access, their devices, um, the location in which you live. So a lot of the internet um, companies and service providers, they if they offer and wire one house in a census tract for internet, the census counts that entire tract as being connected and that is not, not quite accurate. 
um, and, you know, historical information of, you know, kind of the entities coming to not every neighborhood really impacts that. And then certainly income. If you can't afford the latest smartphone and then the data plan and then the broadband in access, um, you know, it's, it's really inhibiting your technology use and understanding. And so with all of that, you know, kind of information that we tried to glean from everywhere, um, we had to think about how we were going to tackle the digital divide at Kaiser Permanente. And as we do with most kind of high level strategic visionary projects, we look to our strategic plan. And, you know, I think that's a, a thing that's always, you know, interesting to think about uh, being referenced a lot, but we do. And it's, you know, we have these five big pillars of what um, we are all about and how that is supported by our foundational commitments. Uh, and tackling the digital divide felt squarely within many of these um, aspects. Certainly when if we want to create a digital first system for our members, certainly if we want to have high quality care, um, equitable health outcomes. And so we knew that this issue was both um, pervasive and within our reach. And the thing is, we started to define digital divide more holistically and more broadly and widened the aperture to be inclusive of what we call digital equity, which is the state in which all have the information technology capacity needed for full participation in society, democracy, and our economy. And those digital inequities impact all social determinants of health, not just access to and quality of healthcare. You know, it shows up in, can you find and apply to a job? Can you find and apply for housing? Can you manage you know, all of the things that you need with education, banking, you know, all the aspects of our lives now that are just all on a screen. Um, and so this was something that we, we knew we could take on and we had to take on. And so our approach was um, threefold. And it had to start with driving adoption um, and making sure that those people who were not comfortable connecting or had no interest in connecting um, if it would serve them, we wanted to help them adopt and learn. Um, but then we knew we had to enable that use. And so what does that start to look like when you think of people who are 65 plus in their 70s and they're trying to navigate a small device um, with arthritic fingers? Um, and there was a lot of learning and informing that we knew we had to do internally um, for our own sake of leveraging the data, building the research, contributing to the evidence base. Um, and so it was a pretty significant effort that we knew would take a lot of cross collaboration and a significant amount of time. Um, but time, as we know with technology, is not in your favor. So um, our approach was to take a systematic view towards this. And the Garfield Innovation Group, particularly within Kaiser Permanente, focuses a lot on human-centered design and always starts with leveraging the lived experience. And so we had to deeply immerse in the lives of our members who are facing digital barriers. What does that look like? Um, what is a day in the life? How does it impact uh, their well-being? We combined that with internal and external data so that we could start to see geographically where are our members facing digital inequities? What does that look like from a region to region standpoint as we have a national footprint? Um, how do we get that community level data to identify those patterns and opportunities um, that present themselves? Um, and then this third big pillar of how do we try some stuff? I think often in healthcare, there's a fear of failure and a fear of going big and a risk of investment. Um, but we try to challenge that and deploy and test and learn quickly so we can fail fast and then try again and see what works and start to measure the data and start to see impact. And if it's not working, we can change it. We haven't invested a lot of money. And so those were a couple of the big steps that we took in trying to create a system that would not only you know help our members, but would also be something that we could sustain and execute as a business so that everyone could fully participate in this digital first world should they choose to do so. And just a little bit of background 
on the recruiting for digital equity, because as you might imagine, uh, today's world of ethnographic study and research relies a lot on the internet. Um, it relies a lot on recruiting entities that have huge databases of people that have signed up um, to be research participants. And so when you take out the internet and this digital connection as a venue into finding people, um, it presents a challenge. And so we try to get, you know, kind of scrappy back to like 10, 15 years ago, what you had to do with asking people kind of on the street with your clipboards at community centers, at libraries, just asking folks if they had an interest and if they met some certain criteria. And so we were um, able to engage 25 folks and we did diary studies, but people were doing just basic SMS text messages um, or going to the local library to send us emails. Um, we had structured interviews just over the phone or in person. Um, we knew that we would have to be uh, multilingual, which is another you know aspect of our member base. It's actually more multilingual uh, and less English speaking than the US population. And so that's something we're always mindful of, um, multiracial um, and focusing more on that lower income bracket. And we pulled from seven of our eight regions um, and really tried to also focus on how are they accessing the internet? How are they paying for healthcare? Um, and what is their health status? Because we were starting to see a correlation between where people lived, uh, how much money they were making, how they were able to pay for healthcare, and then a you know a, an increase in chronic disease comorbidities. And so that um, I think was just an interesting, unexpected correlation that we were finding within our own data. And when we talked to these folks, we established some kind of needs that were shared by all of them. And you'll see here on the left are six needs that are really about enablement and support, kind of these tangible things like the mechanics, the logistics of what people facing digital inequities need or want when it comes to digital services, virtual healthcare, that sort of space. It's things like they just need the ability to access the tools and services. They need those tools and services to accommodate a range of access situations. You know, are they going to the public library to use internet? How does that change the dynamic of a mental health visit that they're having with their provider? Um, they need their unique needs to be supported a lower barrier to entry. I think the step even to sign up for a KP kind of online Health Connect account is nine steps. Um, unsure why it's that long, but that is a turnoff and that's something that we can be better at. Um, support when things don't go well. Um, I think often with healthcare entities, uh, the IT support, portal support, um, it is farmed out, it is contracted out to people whose main job that is. And so then that alone creates a barrier in not being well-versed in the native language of our own systems um, and their support network. A lot of these folks have caregivers, um, you know, their children, their families uh, that are doing a lot of the navigation of the online technology for them on their behalf. And so uh, needing those folks to be empowered to have just as much access uh, and ability to navigate the tools as necessary. And then there were four needs that were more about empowerment and confidence, um, kind of those intangible aspects um, of the space, you know, the the things that you feel more at your core. Um, people want to be self-sufficient. They don't like, they want the help center there, but they also want to feel a sense of agency that they can do it themselves. Um, they want to have a choice and how they receive care. Often, you know, I think coming out of the pandemic, there were a lot of services um, that decided to lead with that first visit being only offered digitally. And that's a big turnoff to somebody who doesn't want to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with their provider through a screen or they can't. Um, needing to feel safe and cared for. You know, I think there is something intimate and personal about being in an exam room, being face-to-face -face with your doctor, being able to touch them, being able to talk, even if it does feel like that rushed 10, 15 minute appointment, um, there's still meaning there. And how do you replicate that 
when it feels hard to make eye contact, um, when you can't hear, when your tech is breaking down, when you're getting frustrated. Um, so those are all aspects to think about. And then finally, needing to feel heard and understood um, when engaging with digital healthcare services. I think a lot of people feel as if it's a bother, if it's, you know, kind of one way, you know, oftentimes because it's also new for physicians, there's frustration on both sides. And so then it just becomes this really heated moment um, that was designed to be, you know, seamless and great, but oftentimes was failing. And so, you know, kind of all of that uh, research of the kind of people experiencing digital equity firsthand, plus what we knew of sort of the research and insights of the space at large, led us to define the problem in three parts. And as I mentioned, we moved away from calling it the digital divide to instel, instead say we're enabling digital equity. And the three parts are access, of course, which the divide is all about, but we added in these layers of accessibility and usability, as well as literacy and comfort. And accessibility and usability, you know, think of the folks who have a physical impairment, mental impairment, um, other disability, who are forced to kind of find their own workarounds, um, who are trying to use platforms that are not making accommodations. Um, you know, the folks that are trying to think through what should be intuitive sort of wayfinding um, buttons, drop down menus, where it isn't intuitive, where it's clunky, where it's a little broken, where it takes you to dead ends. Um, those are the types of things we think of with accessibility and usability, um, even just the language barriers and things like that. Um, you think of literacy and comfort, people who are not super tech savvy, who don't know how to even get the app on their phone, um, who have to make several kind of clicks to get into a virtual visit. Um, all of these things are barriers and, you know, cultural congruence is not always, you know, happening through a screen. Um, many folks aren't comfortable talking about very personal health issues um, with their provider that way. And also think of kind of the context of what might be around um, these particular populations that might live in a very, you know, busy multi-generational home. They don't get the privacy or they're using internet in a public space. You don't get the privacy. And so that comfort and safety um, really does start to matter, especially when you're using those tools and services that are online. And so some of our learnings in each of those three spaces um, are the pieces of the story that I'll share next. And the first is access. And when we were talking to KP members, a large part of what we heard was not necessarily I can't get internet at my home. It was rather, I am making trade-offs between groceries for the month and my data plan. And so that cost versus the value of broadband at home um, was pretty incredible. And so, you know, if you're working multiple jobs, night shifts, second shifts, um, and you're paying already for a smartphone or you don't even want to do that, you're using Wi-Fi that you can find around the community, um, paying for broadband at home, it's not worth it. And if you are in one of these marginalized communities, the internet's spotty, the quality and like power, speed, everything, it isn't great. Um, and just because the internet service provider advertises certain speeds, that does not mean that is the plan that you pay for. Certainly not probably the pan plan that you hope to afford. Um, and so that mobile reception is pushing people to oftentimes have to pay for both, which means they're making trade-offs with the other things that they're able to afford in their home. And so this kind of access issue is um, pretty visceral. And we started to see, as I mentioned, that it was affordability rather than the physical infrastructure availability that was the main driver of broadband access for our members. And we were seeing, you know, kind of estimates around 3 million of our members out of 13 million are facing really low or no access to kp.org, which is our main sort of front door into our systems to be able to do video visits and such. And that's a pretty significant amount of our population. Um, and then pile that onto the quality and reliability of the, um, the service that I've mentioned. And we're requiring folks to have a virtual visit 
20 to 30 megabytes per second internet speed. And that's actually the thing that is costing them out of their internet plan because most plans, you know, they'll start to titrate back after you reach a certain amount of data usage. And so just these compounding problems really impact um, your ability to like have good service. And often when you're not the only person in your home, but you're trying to do something of that kind of speed, it just, it competes with everything else that might be happening. And then finally cost and affordable um, research that we did pointed out that probably 10 bucks a month is what most low income households could afford to spend on the internet without having to make those trade-offs around rent, food, gas for my car. Um, but as we know, $10 a month for internet is nowhere to be seen. Um, average US costs are almost $70 across the board. So that's a pretty significant amount of um, money to pay per month. The next problem space that we drove, dove into was the literacy and comfort area. And we were really seeing that people just need a bit more guidance and feedback to effectively adopt and engage with digital tools and services. And as Kaiser Permanente, we were offering that as online video tutorials. And so that is not how we reach this population that doesn't have the digital tools, access, savvy. Um, and so, you know, people are motivated and they ask, and if you're in an MOB or you're having that moment with your physician, um, there often isn't time or knowledge on how to teach you there in that moment. Um, so that's a big hurdle that we need to overcome. And that's often the first, if you can't get kind of the warm handshake into the system, you, you will leave and not try again. And so building that trust, um, especially around the second piece here about your data privacy, security, we know what we're doing, you know, it's, it takes time and you have to build rapport um, with your member base. Um, I think the other aspect that we discovered in this literacy and comfort bucket is that there's just a broad lack of understanding about what you can do um, virtually for healthcare, what can be addressed versus what you need to physically be in person for. We spoke with a lot of patients who were like, oh, but how am I going to tell my provider what my blood pressure is? How am I going to do X, Y, Z? And it's like, well, for this particular visit, they might not need that information, you know, or there might be other ways and check-in moments that that can happen. And so I think just kind of demystifying the space is something that we need to think of. Um, and then finally, like I mentioned, the digital offerings need to kind of replicate that warmth of the in-person moments, you know, encourage our physicians to understand how to make it seem like you're making eye contact, how to still have that body language. So it feels like you're not just checking a box on your schedule. Um, some of those other cues that really help you kind of foster that warm relationship that we know can otherwise happen in that exam room. And when we started to zoom out and look at more of the data around literacy and comfort, um, we know that you can't learn unless you try. Um, and we need to talk about these things in mediums and places that aren't digital to start. Um, and we really do need to encourage that privacy and security that we you know, enable across our platforms so that people aren't scared that they're going to you know, do something wrong, lose their information, share it with the world, especially the older population who is more prone to getting hacked and all of that good stuff. But, um, you know, we started to look at the app use of the ages of our members. Um, and it was no surprise that those who were 75 or older are only using or comfortable with apps, you know, 25% of them. Um, the communication and ease of communication during in-person versus online visits was drastically different. Um, and, you know, not everyone's super confident that we're doing our part in keeping their information safe. So those are all some hurdles to overcome. And then finally, looking at accessibility and usability, we were seeing that marginalized populations constantly face, you know, this full range of emotional and physical barriers in the digital space, and it's not being um, acknowledged. Um, you know, people spend extra time catching up, getting their issues resolved, um, feeling voiceless and undervalued. And that, you know, kind of personal network that people have um, that can help them increase access to information and help with navigation 
also, you know, needs to be able to be supported, um, be able to kind of surround a member, um, whether they're strangers or a person that they know. You know, I think we saw a lot of people going to forums, looking for help, looking for that, you know, voice of like, you're not alone. Um, and we are starting to see a lot of our older patient population, um, they are not shy about telling you what works, what doesn't, how our font is too small, you know, and all of these other aspects, some in our control, some in theirs. Um, but it's just a good nod that it is, you have to check in with folks because you might think like, oh, the older seniors, they're not using the app. They're not looking at the website. They are, and they have things to say and things that we can fix because if we fix it for them, we often fix it for everyone. And so when we really started to dive into the numbers, um, it was folks with disabilities, uh, the older population support networks that we needed to pay more special attention to. Um, and particularly knowing that, you know, your smartphone is your go-to device. Um, we started to look at um, kind of ownership rates and purchase rates of smartphones, flip phones, um, tablets, laptops, desktops. And uh, with this population that is facing digital inequities, um, usually still nine out of 10 of them have a smartphone. Um, and so it's not necessarily the device um, that is the barrier, it's how to use it um, and having fast enough speed and data to be able to use it effectively for um, things like a healthcare visit. Okay, so that was a lot of the data and sort of the journey we went on to find it and kind of point where we could start to play. And next I'll take you through sort of the framework that we put forward at a very high strategic visionary level um, to start to approach this and to take some small actions, prioritize um, and try some things, like I said. And so we created a, a system, a digital equity system. And this system um, is that three-pronged approach that really helps members adopt and use technology um, while we're informing ourselves around the activities that support that adoption and use. And so, you know, it's it's meant to be ever flowing as the ribbon kind of around this three teardrop shape um, communicates. We need a coordinating kind of entity at the core because as you might imagine, all the different departments and areas of Kaiser Permanente that would have to um, play here need to work together and it needs to be smart and it needs to be connected. And we acknowledge that Kaiser Permanente, we can't do this alone. We're not a big tech agent, right? And so leaning on some of the community system enablers, um, the various partnerships that we have within and across the nation, um, our grant strategy and different investments that we're making um, really start to come together intentionally to kind of be the building blocks of how we can start to chip away at making sure that digital equity is possible across Kaiser Permanente. And so each of these three big um, kind of pillars has within it three sub pillars, which are, you know, more of the um, secondary activities. And then with each and within each of those, we have these items that we call building blocks. And so it's quite complex. I will, this is the last layer of the onion that I'll peel back, but essentially in this adoption yellow space, it's things like talking about why, why does this matter? Why should you care? Why does digital health, digital equity, um, virtual healthcare uh, matter in your life? Um, and so it's, it's the awareness campaigns of what we offer how it improves your health, how it's more timely, um, how it can catch, um, you know, certain certain things that might be happening, how it can still instill that, um, you know, relationship with your provider. Um, it's creating a digital orientation program, making sure that we are not only saying what we have and why it's useful, but like helping people get on board. Um, the third piece in Adopt is really around a digital resource marketplace. So are there community partnerships that we can leverage where there are affordable devices or there are um, you know, other offerings that would help people begin to adopt um, 
digital into their lives. Uh, then looking at the use in the kind of rusty orange red, um, how do we help people use these digital devices and tools and applications? Um, and first that's really thinking about refining our own care delivery, kind of making sure our physicians, our clinicians, our care teams um, can use and you know do it themselves. Right. So they're creating an environment and an experience um, that feels good on the receiving end as well, um, making sure we have inclusive digital platforms. So that this is things like uh, the languages that we have things offered in thinking of those um, who are using screen readers to make sure that we are saying the right things, that we are describing the imagery, that it is useful and intuitive. Um, and the third piece being that tailored tech support. So if we can identify a member as having um, digital barriers, digital inequities, can we, instead of routing them to the usual tech support, can they go to someone who can speak their language, help them through it calmly, um, kind of be of their community and pace so that they can not have that bad tech experience and then um, kind of leave the system forever. Um, and then finally inform, um, is like I said, sort of leveraging what we're doing and trying and then feeding it back into the system. If something isn't working, we can change it. If something um, is doing really well, can we spread it? Um, so it's thinking about contributing more to the digital equity research landscape. Like I said, the, the evidence base, um, it's building every day, but there, I think there's still more to learn, measure, look at longitudinally, how is it impacting health? Um, the second piece being around digital equity data analytics. Um, we were able to really leverage a couple of internal data teams um, to pick apart this problem. So how can we do that more intentionally? How can we build dashboards that look at it at a national level, at a regional level, city level, and then finally, the digital equity policy strategy. How can we start to um, advocate for our patients, you know, starting at the Hill? How can we make sure that the federal subsidies that are offered are relevant, are easy to access, and things like that? So, you know, we, of course, knew that that would be a lot of big words with not a lot of meaning to the folks that we were sharing kind of this content and systems design with. And so we made a top 10 list of where and how do we start? Um, and some of them are easy. Some of them are a little more difficult, um, but certainly, you know, first talking about it, have a national campaign, talk about why it matters, what the benefit, what the value is, um, expand one of the pilots that we had just started in a very small region with a small amount of members um, to go bigger, to fold in more of the subsidies that were offered at a national scale, um, you know, build our data and knowledge base, think about member and provider facing digital education content. Like I said, a lot of our content and how to use our digital tools was online. How can we also have the collateral that is printed in person? How can we send it directly to the member so that they have it and they can do whatever connections they need to from the comfort of their own home? So kind of just getting smart about, um, you know, kind of our own practices there. Um, assess our current portfolio of investments, looking at our policy approach, looking at the grant strategy and partnership approach, um, thinking about that specialized tailored tech support how can we stand that up, um, starting with just even the members that have disabilities, um, updating digital platform standards and processes, and then kind of contribute to the internal consumer excellence work that we're doing across the boards within Kaiser Permanente. And I think now I have just one example of one of our pilots. Um, it was called Digital Equity Connections. Um, as many of you might know, during the pandemic, there was a federal subsidy called the Lifeline Program. Um, and once um, the pandemic ended, it changed names to the Affordable Connectivity Program, but it was essentially giving um, discounts um, monthly for uh, access to broadband services for eligible households. Um, and we started a pilot that was connecting 
um, members that we had identified through a screener of other social health needs. Um, and we would contact them and ask them, hey, you might qualify for this particular program. Are you interested? Um, and we are starting, you know, to, we went from one market to three markets. And now uh, we're continuing to do it across all eight of our markets um, because we saw such great reception, right? Like if you don't know there is a free program out there that helps save you money and access tools that you need, um, it, it's not great. But if your healthcare provider starts allowing that connection, helping you sign up, helping you get access, helping you get that discount, um, it's pretty incredible. And so we leveraged it based on the knowledge that we had with connecting folks with the SNAP program. And so we were able to kind of reach through some email and text campaigns, upwards of 7 million members. Um, and a lot of folks were pretty interested. You know, it, it was one of our more successful programs and pilots that we saw. Um, and so, you know, we were kind of doing a lot of follow-up engagement. It was a lot of heavy lifting, but it ends up being worth it then if we're able to capture those folks with their digital health care um, and kind of prevent them from things getting worse, et cetera. So it was a, a great value for us to pursue. And like I said, it was a pretty great success. And so that's something that we're super proud of. And that was hopefully um, the last little bit that I had to share and just a little closing slide that is definitely our responsibility to help um, kind of meet every member where they are, whether they want to engage with us digitally or not. So we are hoping to close some of those um, health gaps by opening digital doors. So that is all. Thank you. Looking forward um, to any discussion items. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, <clears throat> really uh, fascinating um, data that, that you shared. I really appreciate uh, sort of the comprehensiveness uh, of understanding sort of what, what those needs are, particularly uh, with regard to uh, our seniors and elderly uh, population. That seemed to be quite a bit of the focus, which is completely um, understood. You're, you're welcome to stop sharing. You can keep this up if you'd like. I know there are a, a couple of um, questions in our chat uh, that I would love to have you uh, get to, but I, I, I do have one just sort of interesting comment and question, and it just occurred to me at, um, as you were giving sort of your last point of, around <clears throat> the, those those priority areas, particularly looking at um, access, and I'm, I'm assuming advocating for access post pandemic. I mean, it's a shame that so many of those programs, you know, ended um, following following the pandemic. But it occurred to me that there seemed to be a lovely window that has opened up and it sounds like some of your work is tapping into to that in terms of accessing other issues outside of healthcare, those issues, you know, those other social determinants that yeah. so much of that is necessary before we get to the physician or we get to the doctor, we get to the healthcare facility, access to food, access to resources around housing, access to, you know, legal support. And it seems like this opportunity that Kaiser and I'm sure other <clears throat> healthcare industries are, are looking at providing sort of this, this resource, it seems like this is the, to me, that's the, that's the key. That's the benefit that is, you know, going to, going to move us in the direction of, of health equity. So I, I don't know what your thoughts about my rambling question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love that because it's an interesting space. We have um, an office of community health and within that is a social health practice um, that is sort of spearheading a lot of this work. Um, and um, it started with what we call a social health screener, which started, I think, is just a few questions around, you know, if, you, if a member goes in for an appointment with their P P PCP or other specialist. Um, there's sort of this initial Q and A, which I think a lot of us probably experience, but it gets into um, certain things around, do you ever have um, issue affording housing month to month? Do you ever have issue accessing food um, month to month? You know, and certain questions that start to tease out those social determinants. Um, 
And we capture all of that data and it's linked into a, a patient's electronic medical records. So then we have all of the data on all 13 million of our members and we can start to see the relevance of certain programs that we have. And we have a, you know, entire um, department that is dedicated to understanding what is happening at the federal level with policy and government relations and all of that good stuff. And so we can start to understand, you know, we got our, our foot in the door with connecting members to the SNAP program. And then it was the affordable connectivity program. And now we're looking more into, you know, WIC and other entities that we know that are commonly, you know, kind of across, across the boards. Um, and we're trying to crack that code on both. How do we screen for it? How do we capture that information? Um, how do we do the outreach? And then how do we do the connecting? Because that is the hands-on part where a person might say, the SNAP website is too complicated. I can't even, I'm not, I don't know where all this paperwork is and da, da, da. And we will actually sit on the phone with them and coach them through that process. Because if we're able to help them with those things, in the long run, it does help, you know, KP. In theory, we are paying less money than to help keep these people well if they have access um, and can live a little bit healthier of a life. I love that. I, I would love to hear more about uh, about that as it as it, you know, uh, as, as you kind of build build up mm -hmm. uh, in that in that direction. Um, we have a question for from our wonderful uh, Arthur Camargo, uh, and he's asking about uh, whether Kaiser or other HMO clinic systems have used um, considered using a med pad uh, provided to their members um, without charge. And it's, I know you kind of touched on that a little bit. Yeah, we've tried not related to this particular um project, but there have been other projects that have definitely tried um, giving or lending a member a device. We tried um, kind of a, a, what we called a, you know, care in the home project where members were given an iPad and it was specifically loaded with some uh, applications that we wanted them to use to interface with their care team. Um, and at first, little rocky, right? Because there's an uptake in education and learning, but if they have that human there to help them understand it, um, you know, it's not like they end up abusing it or losing it or selling it or whatever, because it does become such an integral part of their healthcare. So we've tried it. We haven't rolled these things out at scale, um, but that's certainly something that we think about looking at, right? Especially as we do more um, care in a person's home. We have a cardiac rehab program um, that sends patients instead of, you know, after a, a heart event, instead of keeping them or making them come to a facility five days a week, 5 p.m., you know, it's allowing them to do cardiac rehab in their home and they have just enough of the devices that they need. And then the connection points with the care team to be able to track their process, make sure they're doing whatever they need to appropriately um, and kind of monitor them over time. So maybe you're going in once a week instead of five days a week. And the adherence to the rehab program has grown significantly. And so we've we've tried things in doses like that, um, but it's often related to a particular disease state or need, not necessarily for those who simply um, have trouble with affordability, access, um, that sort of thing. So, but I think there's more to come, right? As we all know, like think of the large organizations where you just have computers and devices everywhere, and then you get a new one every three to five years. So I think there's a lot of potential partnership in figuring that out to be had. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. And I just, just kind of going back, I know this data has been captured over time, and I was curious. You may have mentioned it, but uh, uh, in terms of the timing, you know, how things have changed in terms of perceptions, desires, needs, wants of the population in terms of their desire to have this as a platform, pre and post COVID, for example. Yeah, it's almost um, as if, you know, the the pandemic was a blessing and a curse at the same time, right? Because it forced a lot of um, health to happen virtually and um, it, not without good reason, right? And so I think people 
they had to get comfortable with it if they wanted it. And so I think, um, you know, unfortunately it did deter a lot of folks, but now that we've had a couple of years of the actual pandemic and now afterwards, um, people are getting more comfortable. I think as we've all, you know, become remote workers or had to have more virtual worlds um, in our space, whether we wanted to or not, the comfort and learning curve has, has, you know, kind of gone up with time. And so that um, expectation of healthcare to be digital and virtual and for it to be just as good as if you're going to the clinic. Um, you know, I think we're seeing that it is kind of increasing accessibility. It's increasing our ability to have access rates because often there'll be um, issues that we face with people just can't get in in six months. But if we can connect you with, um, you know, your provider at a time that's convenient for you online, you don't need to leave work, et cetera, it can be a very, you know, kind of game changing uh, offering. No, th um, thank you for that. And as you were talking, I, I was also thinking about um, or answering that question, but thinking about you mentioned earlier some of the some of the other sort of overall general concerns around security, for example, um, uh, uh, being in public spaces, perhaps, and dealing with issues around you know HIPAA things of that nature. Um, what what can public health professionals or people you know speaking of students who are um, planning to be be in this field as as clinicians, but folks with a public health lens, what do you think should be their priorities moving forward as many of them will be moving into positions as clinicians, as well as uh, public health professionals? What platform should they be looking at to advocate on, on behalf of, of their patients? I think that's a great question. And it makes me think of you know, these healthcare giants and entities of the world, they can only do so much, right? We need to be able to meet the patients where they are. And if they are needing to do, you know, their therapy session in the library, it's not great, but it's doable. But how can we also think about what is already in community that is trusted as a place where people go and they can feel safe, you know, thinking of places of fellowship and community centers, um, the, you know, churches of this world and like other, other communities that are already in place, other entities um, that are doing the work and offering things. How can we, I don't know, kind of not have to take it all on as healthcare, but um, partner with communities and leverage what could exist in a community. You know, I think as kind of urban sprawl has happened, we've gotten away from city center, but how can we bring back um, even some of that? And so it's kind of thinking outside of traditional healthcare walls um, and even, you know, kind of our traditional interaction models now, either in person or virtually, um, and just being creative and innovative and, you know, kind of willing to try something new um, and different and kind of, I don't know, kind of going against the status quo. So I don't know if that's like really an answer, but I think it's a way to like encourage creative thinking and to suggest things that might seem wild and crazy. Cause I think that's the the space that we're starting to dive into is pushing the bounds of what's possible and what, what we need to own versus what we can share. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that because I, you know, I know for many of us, we, you know, this train has left the station and left the station long, long ago. And um, I think uh, as you, as you mentioned, thinking about cre creative solutions, leveraging those existing um, spaces and community partnerships. And I think if people understand that those are the processes that entities like Kaiser are ensuring takes place, I think it will kind of alleviate some, uh, you know, a lot of the fears that people do have, um, because I, I do think people are extremely fearful and, you know, feel that eventually there, there won't be any sort of, you know, personal uh, con connection. So I think as a part of the awareness campaign, I'm hoping that that is, uh, is included in, in this work. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, you know, even like our physicians don't want to lose that in-person moment either. Right. So that is such a critical aspect of what we do, but how can we 
embed that in a community <laughs> instead of always making the patients come to us. And so it's thinking of things like culinary kitchens and community centers or partnering with other folks that are doing food drives. You know, it's, it's, it's all of these different pieces that have to come together and being willing to get out of our comfort zones. Yeah. Well, listen, Caroline, we want to thank you for this really in informative and thought provoking conversation. I think you've given us a lot of food for thought as we kind of move move forward and really ensure that we uh, meet the de demands of maintaining an inclusive society um, as, as uh, technology continues to soar. So I wanna thank you for the work that you've done um, and we certainly appreciate your time this evening. So yeah, thank nice you so you. much. It was great to be here and um, yeah, hope, hope to see the work carried forward and just the inspiration from tonight. So thank you all. We will definitely stay in touch. Thank you again. Good night. Good night.